I'm Michael Gaucher, and it is April 9th, 2024, and it's 2.42 p.m. Central Time. And today marks the 30th day that I've went on a prolonged fast without any food consisting of just liquids. Coconut water, spring water, and tea, as well as distilled water fortified with cell food, or concentrates trace minerals. And I did the fast so that I could align my spirit, align my being with all the changes that are occurring in the earth, in the cosmos, and in this section of the galaxy at large. And while that may seem far-fetched, all of these events that I am referring to are scientifically observed and they are scientifically verified. First, I refer to the Schumann resonance. The Schumann resonance is a frequency that occurs on the Earth's surface. You can research that a little bit uh, further, but Schumann resonance you have the conjunction of Earth, the Sun, and the planet Sirius. That's also up for research. It has been scientifically observed and verified. You have the twin solar eclipses, one that occurred last October 14, and one that occurred yesterday April 8th. And so with these events, there's an opportunity for one's energy to be realigned with nature. You ever heard when it's a full moon, people act weird? Have you ever heard that when it's a full moon, people act weird? That's also scientifically observed and confirmed. For you see, the moon affects the waters. It affects the tides. And since the human body has a preponderance of water among the majority that are hydrated adequately, then it follows logically that lunar events will have an effect on people in general. So you can extrapolate out from that that the energies in the cosmos, the energies that are in this part of the galaxy and that emanates from the Earth itself, similarly has an effect on people. And my fast was to coordinate with, the cha with these changes so that if there is an opportunity for improvement of myself with this restriction of food aligned with spirituality, general spirituality, then I say, why not? The spirit world sometimes asks or expects for you to put your money where your mouth is. So that's what I did. I applied my will. I applied my determination. And I set about the path of discipline and the balance of emotion and reason to achieve and pursue and seek spiritual process that is further and beyond what I once experienced in religion. I was a Catholic for nearly 45 years from birth. I was born and into this world and one month later I was baptized 
in the city of Chicago, Chicago, Illinois, United States, America. And from that time forward until roughly somewhere in 2020, 2021, I practiced Catholicism, deeply studied in it, deeply read and researched in the doctrines. I met with a spiritual director or one that was um, being, were themselves being trained as a spiritual director or spiritual advisor. For several years, we met once a month for several years. And we discussed religion, theology, and all kinds of things. I was an usher in the Catholic Church. I collected money. I participated in the ritual of the Mass, both as part of the laity and as an usher, part of the officiate of those services. And so I learned a lot from Catholicism and organized religion. But my path, I was driven to go elsewhere in how I pursued spiritual process. And according to Catholic canon law, once baptized and once born into Catholicism, always Catholic, unless excommunicated. And I have not been excommunicated, but I don't participate in the Catholic way, and that is not a way that I will be returning to for the remainder of this existence in this plane of existence. But like I said, I learned a lot from that. What I'm expressing in this discussion is the conclusion of this fast and spiritual process for me. This discussion is not intended to be instructional by any means. The vast majority of video that as of 2024, I have uploaded to YouTube was my way of documenting my life's journey. That was the number one priority. Occasionally, I may do a video that was instructional in nature, but I also have seven or nine blogs, and I used to write very actively on those blogs. I found video to be a little more expedient and video to be more accurate than the words that one wrote. Because no matter how you form sentences and paragraphs, something is always lost in translation. But you can't lose much in translation when it's a direct video recording. And so that's why I like video now where previously I did not. So this discussion, I want to put on record what I see with fasting, what I've experienced. If this discussion incidentally, coincidentally, has benefit for others, that's awesome. The main purpose of this discussion is so that at a minimum, if I come back years from now and I look back on my life, I have a set of recordings on this YouTube channel that I keep backups of where I can more quickly look and see, oh, back then that was my frame of mind. That was the activities I was engaged in. And this is what my life looked like. This is how I looked. Those are things you cannot capture fully in a blog. And you cannot share those things 
with others in writing. They can't see images of how you looked. They can't see images of how the circumstances around you looked. You can do the best storytelling all you want and words alone, whether verbal or written, cannot compare to an actual live recording. So that's that part. If you hear snoring, that is um, my dog Rocky sitting here bored to death from my usual machinations singing bowls, mantras, chanting, mixing coconut water or mixing spring water with something or brewing tea, sitting at a computer, playing YouTube content, bored out of his mind. The highlight of his day is when I bring out a treat. I like old Rory uh, chewing bones, chewing sticks, and I give that to him once or twice, in some rare instances, three times in a day on my days off, and at least once a day before I leave for work um, on those other days. And then, um, you know, I like to spoil him with um, other things beyond dog food. And that's the highlight of his day when I bring out um, some special food other than that hard, crunchy dog food that he is accustomed to. And so I spoil him quietly and silently because Rocky is not really my dog, but I spend a lot of time with Rocky and he um, approaches me as a second owner. And so uh, today I gave him Purina One uh, beef and bison. And uh, I've been giving him some other things. Um, a, a pro plan uh, performance and pro plan weight weight management or something like that. You buy it at Walmart for like $1.50 a can. And, you know, the pro plan uh, formulation comes out like a spam. I mean, it's like a beef mixture or it's a chicken mixture, but no matter which recipe, it comes out like spam. And it's quite a contrast, quite ironic that while I'm refraining from food, I'm giving Rocky all the best food in the world. But I thought I'd try something different and I got Rocky some um, Purina, uh, Purina One beef and bison. And when I opened uh, the can for the first time, about an hour ago, I was quite surprised to see that it was actual chunks of meat in a uh, liquid. And I was like, yeah, he's definitely gonna love that. And I wasn't mistaken. When I poured that into his bowl, he ate that better than anything I ever gave him other than KFC or something like that. I don't do that anymore. I don't give him junk food uh, like that from a bit. Way back when, it was convenient to get like uh, five pieces of uh, chicken for five dollars or, you know, on sale through the drive through and it was just quicker to do that. But um, I decided that if I, if I give Rocky some food, it has to meet the same standards that I would want for myself with food that I eat. So no artificial, no artificial ingredients, no artificial flavors, no artificial colors. So no red, blue, no, no red, 40, blue, 50, whatever those numbers are, whatever. Um, it needs to be natural ingredients. Um, can't do anything about organic slash non-GMO versus whatever. Can't do anything about that. But, you know... Um, like at least make sure it's like straight up meat and, um, you know, no 
extra stuff that's like way off left field. So, yeah. So, Rocky absolutely loved that. Took him outside a few times a day. He absolutely loved that. And um, gave him some grapefruit. I've uh, conditioned him to be able to eat uh, grapefruit and a few other things. And so, I do research to make sure that nothing that I give him uh, will have bad interactions. But right now, because food is done, you know, um, chewy bones are done and outside is done, Rocky is quite settled down. But that's the snoring that you'll hear. During my fast, which began on a Saturday in March at roughly 10 p.m. It was a Saturday so that I started, but I count my fasts on Sundays because it's easier to keep track of that um, when I'm looking at a calendar. I can just go Sunday to Sunday, but I actually started the fast on the Saturday prior to Ramadan. I started it on the Saturday prior to Ramadan 2024. And I had no intention of starting it on Ramadan, but I said, well, you know, that works. At least I know in the back of my mind, somewhere in the world, there are approximately a billion other people that are fasting at the same time. I am, though they may not be going to the same extent that I am. But the primary thing was to make sure that my fast coordinated with the solar eclipse. So I kept putting it off and putting it off and putting it off. And I was like, I've reached the critical point where I can't put it off anymore. Or I'll be either starting my fast too late or... I will just simply undershoot or overshoot the mark on the solar eclipse. And so, so I started it on the Saturday before Ramadan and I started counting starting that Sunday before Ramadan and I just kept up with it that way. So uh, day one and then the next Sunday, right? Um, that's... Um, day uh, 7, and then 14, then 21, then 28, right? So I just do it like that by keeping track of that, keeping track of it that way. So on that basis, Monday, April 8, 2024, marked day 29. And so today being Tuesday, April 9th, 2024, makes day 30. So that was the time frame that I wanted to work with. I considered doing some smaller fasts earlier in 2024, but I decided that just wasn't necessary. So will this be the only fast that I do in 2024? More than likely, strong possibility. I've done quite a bit of research where I know the scientific health reasons and health aspects of fasting that is known to Western science. And so I decided to simultaneously take advantage of that. It's like, why not? You know, why not? Um, get a two for one, spirituality and health improvement. But um, the fast that I did in the past, they did help me in my health. And I think I'll talk about that in just a little while in this conversation. But as far as time frames, I tried to keep the time frames uh, very strategically defined based on spiritual objectives and spiritual seeking.
The question I get asked the most when people learn that I'm fasting, and I don't disclose it to most people. I have people that I work with that I have to tell them because otherwise they will see certain aspects of my behavior and the way my body moves that seem kind of odd, that seem kind of out of the ordinary. And so in some cases, I selectively disclose so that people don't get worried. But in general, I would have preferred to have 100% silence on fasting other than through the video platform. But I work in situations where I'm exposed to quite a number of people. And so on the order of 40, 40 uh, core people that I'm exposed to in my workplace, and then beyond that, an average of about, let's say, 200 to 500 uh, people in a week or every two weeks or so, well over a thousand or so people in a month's time. And so I have to be a little bit more um, open with what I'm doing in my life and how I'm going about things so that, you know, there are no rumors and there are no misunderstandings about how I'm expressing myself and how I am conducting myself um, in the ordinary course of business. And of course, I have a close inner circle of relatives who I keep informed about my life and about how I'm pro progressing in my personal activities. And so my close inner circle knows what's going on with me. And it just so happened that my close inner circle of relatives all work in healthcare. So I get it all the time about, oh, make sure you look at this or, oh, make sure you look at that. And that also helps me be informed a little bit. You know, having a, a family of nurses, a family of certified, formal, formally trained nurses. And you would be amazed at the conversations where they're coming from a very staunchly allopathic perspective and I'm coming from a very strident homeopathic and naturopathic perspective. And so very interesting conversations. And sometimes we meet in the middle. But the thing of it is, is that my fast is intended to be a spiritual process. And the number one question I get asked is, does fasting Im imbue you with enlightenment? And I have to say very honestly that the answer is no. Enlightenment, in my view, is not a function of what you do. It's a function of your state of mind. It's a function of your heart. It's a function of your inner being. So spiritual theater, spiritual theatrics, and spiritual routine, going through the motions just to be going through them, even if it seems somewhat elaborate by other criteria, in my view, that is not a path to enlightenment, but a path to spiritual distraction. But I know some seek enlightenment, but the thing is, is that my view of spirituality is to seek inner improvement, point blank period, A to Z, full stop period. Inner transformation, inner improvement, improvement inside. Because when you can improve inside, then all those improvements, they just start to echo out. And you can contribute better. You can contribute better. And it's a wonderful thing, right? Where you can build on your inner core foundation 
and not get distracted by trying to become the spiritual equivalent of a Marvel movie narrative or Marvel movie character and just go about your business on the path of evolution and transformation with him. So for the rest of my existence on this plane that we call the third dimension, I'll be a broken record. All questions that come my way about spirituality, they all summarize down to inner evolution, inner improvement, inner transformation and refinement. And it's an unlimited, unlimited journey and process. You can stop when you want. You can pause and take a break when you want. And you always have the opportunity to resume the journey from where you left off. Or if you move further back, you have to keep going up to where you last left off at some point or whatever. Or maybe get a good acceleration and then move on from there. Whatever the case may be. It's a great, great experience. And everybody participates in it, some knowingly and some, I would say, most unknowingly. And so in my view, spirituality is not what some religions represent, where you are this perfectly positive person, where you're this perfectly well-made individual where you got it all figured out. I don't think so. Because everything we can experience in life, the good and the bad, is part of life. And spirituality is life. So, if you got a dark side, but you know how to work with it productively and constructively, that's fine. Spirituality and the, seek, the process of seeking allows you to go about through refinement. You got a very generous, compassionate side, love, kindness, goodness, and you can balance it with the world and nature at large with it's sometimes adversity and confrontation and stressors and pressure then wonderful that's part of the process balance 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 the emotion balance the logic balance the selfish Balance the selfless. Unify them together in the right way to work more holistically or towards a holistic and harmonious interaction with reality in real time to the maximum extent possible. So that is the answer that I have given in a variety of ways in different conversations about what is the goal with spirituality, what is one of the byproducts of fasting is that inner development. And I've read thousands of spiritual books. I can't even remember all that stuff, you know. To be just quite honest, I can't remember all that stuff. I just remember the parts that I want to remember. Let's put it that way. I remember the parts I want to remember. And I'm not one that, I'm a scholar, like I can study and research things, but I'm not the type of scholar that memorizes the encyclopedia of works that I've encountered and can regurgitate them and recite them with great um, fluidity and fluency of thought and recall. I'm not that person. But I do know how to, I do know how to apply what I've read 
I know how to apply what I've read. And the things I do remember, we go based on cognitive science. You're going to remember that which is most important to you. So if I do repeat something, or I do recite something, or I do bring up something that I read, and I mention the actual book's title, or whatever, it was important to me. Doesn't mean that the other thousands of books that I read over the course of my life was unimportant or didn't have something to impart, but you evolve and you move forward and some new things become more important than some of the old things. And that's just the way it falls down. So spiritual process for me is evolution. And the fasting is a way where you can really focus and put clarity onto that objective. And let me talk about that. Before I talk about that, I want to let you know that the way I do video is I get up and I stop the video recording and then I start a new recording. And the reason I do that is that's a technique I've learned when using mobile, mobile devices. I use the iPhone to record my videos, but if you just do a video in a single take on an iPhone, you will A, run out of storage, B, run out of time, or three, look, I mixed it up. I said A, B, and then I said three. Or C, your video file will be so large, you'll have a heck of a time trying to transfer that to a computer for final editing, or whatever, because you really do not want to edit on an iPhone. I've done it many times using iMovie. You don't really want to do that. I've had some great uh, results with iMovie on the iPhone, but you really don't want to do that. Um, when it comes to a much larger conversation, for a 20 minute clip, it can work out really well. But when you're really trying to just express yourself through video, and you get the final result and you need to tailor it a little bit so it's cleaner and more polished. You do not want to do iMovie on the iPhone and you do not want to have a recording that's a single take. It's very good, something that I've learned, to just have multiple clips in succession and stitch them together so that you're able to transfer the files individually to, I use an external flash drive an iPhone flash drive and I transfer it to a computer. And so flash drives are usually formatted where the maximum file size is somewhere in the neighborhood of four gigabytes. 4.372 gigabytes to be almost exact, but let's not count the pennies. Four gigabytes. And you can easily do a single take video that exceeds five, six, and sometimes eight gigabytes. And you may have enough storage on your phone, but like I say, to do it, to do the videos justice, you are now stuck editing it on the phone because of the file size. And you don't get it as an efficient transfer rate when you're uploading it to YouTube and blah, blah, blah. So that's why I pause so that I can conclude a take. And it also helps me with the subsequent editing after the fact. And it makes sure that I don't sit here talking and I actually lost the entire video because I ran out of storage, I ran out of time, or I simply have to delete the whole conversation because the logistics of getting the video moved to the appropriate editing venue becomes... Um, so large of a prospect that um, I might as well just uh, say, I'll do, do this some other time. So that's the reason for these, um, these transitions that you see and my, um, my P 
pacing of my dialogue. So clarity and focus in fasting towards the objective of spiritual process and inner transformation. So what does that look like? What that looks like is that you peel away one of the primary distractions in our physical existence which is eating. And eating in and of itself is not a bad thing. Not at all. Eating in and of itself is not a bad thing at all. Okay? But sometimes you need to step away from food because Again, it's not the eating. What I've come up with, it's what's involved with eating. What's involved with eating. The time to prepare for eating. Your thoughts about when you're going to eat. What you're going to eat. Maybe how you're going to eat. And how long you're going to eat. Where you're going to eat. So on and so forth. And I thought about doing a study. You heard me open a package, didn't you, Rocky? Now, this ain't for you. You've had yours. But, uh, yeah, dogs can't have chocolate. You can have carrot bean powder, which I have a little bit in, the, in here. But you can't have chocolate. It's not for you. But... You know, it'd be interesting to see how much time a person actually spends nourishing their body through solid food. And you'll find it can range anywhere from, I mean, you think it might be 15 minutes, but there's always the warm up to eating. You got to stop what you're doing. You got to walk to your destination where the food is. Sometimes you have to prepare food. It's just a drink, my friend. It's just a drink. Unless you hear somebody outside. But it's all that time you um, spend, like cooking food or ordering it out, sitting in a drive through line. Maybe the order was wrong. You know, you name it. You add up that time. I've kind of looked at that time kind of just in an informal, uh, rough uh, analysis. It can come out to be about anywhere from two hours to four, sometimes six hours in a day. For those that actually cook meals and have to clean up before, prepare for the cooking of the meal, and then some cleanup, and then cooking the meal, and then actually serving and eating the meal, and then cleaning up after the fact. That can be quite a range of time. That can be quite a range of time, right? And so I found that that process itself can really disrupt the flow of one's thoughts the one, the flow of one's movements on a particular agenda. So when you subtract out that eating and all the things that are involved with that, then you have a lot more time to focus in on critical questions, key concepts, and a broader perspective. And so that's a major part of it, is subtracting out that time involved with feeding, feeding oneself solid food. Also, there is that aspect of 
the nature of the food and how it can pull you away into a cycle of pleasure, a cycle of comfort, a cycle of escape when that may not be the right method of escape that you need. The right method of escape may be meditation. The right method of removing yourself from the cares of this world may be meditation. That's not, meditation is not for everybody. It really isn't. I'm, I've, got, I've gotten to a point where I don't hold to a lot of absolutes. I try to not hold to a lot of absolutes. Things don't apply to everybody. Certain diets don't apply to everybody. Certain health practices. Everybody's body and everybody's life is different. But in the general sense, fasting is the elimination of distraction first and foremost. Before it's the elimination of food. Fasting is the elimination of distractions that creates the space in which you can apply yourself however much you want to apply yourself. And make no mistake, I'm not sitting eight hours a day chanting, running singing bowls and watching spiritual content on YouTube and reading books and none of that. I don't do all of that. I used to, but I don't do all of that. Now, what I do is I say, self, body, hey, it's a good idea to hit your thymus gland. It's good for you. But body, hey, we are going to move to the next level. For me personally, it was, we're going to get rid of that processed oil out of our diet. We're going to get rid of that processed sugar out of our diet. We're going to get rid of those thick breads that we love so much, right? So accomplish that in May 2022 in a three-day fast. Accomplished it. Knocked it out of the park. Wonderful. December 2022, three-day fast. Just needed to tiptoe and see, hey, can I fast while I'm also working an eight-hour day? Because that may, that may fast. All of my previous fasts, with the exception of maybe one, but there was one exception years, many years ago. I think it was 2018 or 2017. Anyway, but all my fasts, except for way back when, and um, the one I did in December. I'm sorry, say that a different way. All my other fasts, up until the recent times in the last 18 months, I would be on pay time off. I'd be off from work. Because I felt like, I, you know, it would be too much of a challenge to fast and be active. But I didn't know the science of fasting. Back then, I was part of a religion, and fasting was a typical thing in the religion I was in, right? It's like you could be in a religion, and you're doing fasting because that's what you're taught as a doctrine, and not know what the actual side effects, why are you having brain fog, why are you like just struggling, and you start to believe that the struggle is part of the fast, and you know, all of that kind of stuff, you know? Anyway, so it was like, I just, but, so then when I'm like on a more normal basis and I'm incorporating science, you know, into to my um, way of doing things and not just with computers and certain things, right? And achieving a more balanced view of existence. Then it's like, um, yeah. You need to be active when you're fasting. You're more likely to be successful with fasting when you're active. So, so let's try it out. So I tried it out in December 2022. 
it was out it was okay so then February 2023 sorry I got something on my lip lip is peeling a little bit that's actually a good thing skin peeling during fasting means your skin is rejuvenating but apparently in this case it's just my uh, lip but anyway during the February fast in 2023 I did take time off but during that fast I was helping somebody out with their computer and um, that took me a few days and so I ended up being active regardless which was a good thing because if I I was crashing and burning in that uh, February uh, fast it was in uh, 2023 that was that was the roughest one that was the roughest one and there I was fasting on grapefruit juice and Taiwanese oolong gaba tea it was rough as all get out so I never want to fast like that again with uh, fruit juice and then I learned later the science behind fruit juice and then I look back and I see how much of uh, that was a horrible idea but by June of 2023 I had um, a much better understanding of science involving fasting and physiology and biology I was able to successfully complete a 13-day fast during that time and then my knowledge has continued to increase and improve and I kept doing research because I research all the time I'm always studying something so by the time of the 30-day fast in September October last year we also had artificial intelligence so I used all the tools at my disposal and I was ready to go and that was my most successful long fast so by the time I got to this fast you know, I won't say it was exactly a walk in the park, but I was able to um, be less distracted by the fast itself and focus on programming my body and my being to live in this world under more of a constraint so that when I resume normal eating and diet and that sort of thing, What'd you see, Rocky? Hmm? You jumpy, man. Why are you jumping? Then I would um, be much more solid in my frame and in my being. So having lifted these weights, so to speak. So... I'd say that process is very successful and I've had many experiences during these 30 days that has allowed me to refine that spirituality in a practical way, practical applied spirituality. And so I'm pleased with that process. One might wonder what kind of struggles I've had during this fast. And I want to share those struggles so that if anyone does find this useful, you'll probably find this part of the discussion the most useful. So let's talk about the struggles of the fast. So I've done a lot of research where the number one thing you need in fasting to do it scientifically, even though you may be doing it spiritually, is electrolytes. Now, like I say, I'm a little bit studied, a little bit studied in Buddhism, far less knowledgeable of Islam, and I know a fair bit about the yogic practices in the Himalayan yogic way of going about things, both from a Tibetan 
and Hindu standpoint. So I know a little bit there, but I know the most, despite not being a practice practitioner, I know the most about Christianity because I grew up with it for over 45 years. So if I recall correctly, and this could be a misunderstanding on my part, but when the person they call Yahweh, uh, Yeshua, was fasting in the desert, that individual, if I recall correctly, was able to find some moisture from a cactus or whatever every now and again. Well, here's the thing about that, if that's true and if I recall that correctly. Cactus is going to have electrolytes in it. So there you go. My electrolyte consumption of choice is coconut water. It's coconut water. And for approximately, let's see if I can get it right, approximately 25 days in the fast, I did the coconut water without cocoa powder or any add-ins, just straight coconut water. So I wanted to do that this time around. So it's only in the last five days as I started to wind down this fast that I started adding coconut water and ashwagandha and carrot bean powder and that sort of thing because these constituents, they add fibers within the body. And these fibers will very gently wake up the gut microbiome without triggering digestion. So that's been my strategy in the last five days. I know when people break a fast, they will break it gently with a bone broth or that sort of thing. Or if you're vegan, like I tend to link, I don't like to use labels. But if I were labeled, I would be labeled a vegan. Whole, I, I like the term whole food, plant-based diet. But anyway, but vegan, because I stay away from dairy. But I, I, would, I use vegetable broth. So when I do break my fast tomorrow, it's going to be with vegetable broth and miso paste. I'm going to have miso paste for the first time. I'm going to make miso soup from scratch. In the, in the past, I broke my fast either with a salad or in the last two fasts, I broke them with uh, chana masala, Indian chana masala. But this time around, I decided to go with Japanese miso soup. And then I wanted to get very precise, like a scientist, right? I didn't want to go from just doing liquids to now just introducing a solid. I want to do I wanted to do it on a gradient curve. Right? I want to do it very I wanted to do it even more gradually than that. So I started introducing fiber. Fiber that's fine enough in its particulate density that it does not register in the body as an element that's worthy of digestion. So it just goes right through me. And it goes past my stomach right into the gut because that is possible. So, but the bacteria that are in the gut, they can use that fiber, right? 
So then my theory is that by the time I actually start, when I, okay, let's not say by the time I start, because that's tomorrow. I'm talking like it's, you know, long way off now. We're literally talking about, you know, tomorrow morning. So, but tomorrow, so my theory is tomorrow that when I have finished uh, making that soup and I eat it, that I'm going to have a much better time digesting that soup than I would if it took more time for the digestive system in coordination with the mitochondria and the gut microbiome to recognize the presence of solid food. That's my theory. So you don't drink that all the way down because you got more solid constituents there. So that's my theory. And what that will achieve is I can contract the time it takes to go from that more limited solid food to a regular meal. So rather than going off of the practice in the medical research of maybe taking a week before you get to a full meal. And I will say, and I admit that in the past when I broke a fast, I just went right into a full meal. Those last two times, man, I had chana masala in a container like this. And I know that the uh, proprietors of these Indian restaurants very well, and they made it vegan style for me. You know, we had a good discussion about what's vegan on here. I don't want no dairy. I don't even want ghee butter. And they hooked me up. But a container like this, some rice, and I'm going to pile it on with some minced pickles and some non bread. Day one, breaking the fast like that. Not advised at all. <laughs> Not advised at all. But, I, you know, some would say I was lucky. I didn't have refeeding syndrome. Okay, great. But, and I don't think I would have refeeding syndrome now if I uh, did that. But I just decided I want to do things more properly, do things more expeditiously. And if I do fast like this in the future, I just want to get into the habit of taking a more uh, measured approach. So I decided to go with soup. Though technically you could call what I had previously soup. Chana masala is a type of soup. It just has beans in it, uh, thicker beans. So yeah. So anyway, but we're talking about struggles. And I said all of that to say that the important thing is electrolytes. And that's going to make a lot of sense when I say more about struggles here in a moment. So I have electrolytes down, down to a science, down to an art form, you could say. I didn't even use the techniques this time that I um, collaborated with artificial intelligence on where I can mix different herbal teas together to produce electrolytes. I didn't even use that science. I didn't need to. And besides, it's a little more expensive to do it that way. So I wanted to save some costs this time around. And um, the only tea that I really relied on was those teas that boosted uh, concentration. So panic ginseng, and those teas that had like lion's mane and ginkgo biloba and go to cola. Other than that, the other teas were just, uh, you know, nice to have that were herbal because I also wanted to detox at the same time. I wanted to take herbs in the form of liquid, liquid teas. And speaking of herbs, I actually uh, also used uh, herbal extract like uh, party oak, party arco extract and mullet leaf extract in the dropper. The mullet leaf extract, you put it in like that. It's supposed to 
dislodge all this mucus and stuff, I overdid it and I ended up getting sick for about five days and messed up my vocal cords, messed up everything. And somewhere back in my mind, I was like, maybe you should stop fasting because this is starting to get serious. You're coughing up at night. You are spitting up all this mucus. And somebody told me about mullein leaf. And I said, hey, why not try it? Because when you're fasting, you are the most receptive to herbs and uh, things like that. So I had it in liquid form, pure liquid form. I put it right in here and uh, I overdid it, I will say. And um, yeah, I learned a great lesson from that. Mullen leaf works. If you try to get mucus out of your body, it works. But if you, if you overdo the dosage and I was taking the dropper directly in. You really should dilute it in water. I should have diluted it in water. But hindsight is twenty twenty, as the uh, saying goes. And um, yeah, I cleared all the mucus out of my system. That mucus I didn't even know I had. And um, and that had a like a chain reaction because then other things I didn't know was going on with me um, was starting to clear up. It's like, but it was painful coming out. It's like, man, because normally when I'm fasting, I don't get sick. So this was sickness that I induced on myself. So that was part of my struggle. But that was uh, like two weeks ago, uh, ending in the first part of last week. So it took me about five days. It's like, wow. So anyway, but I'm glad all of that got cleared up because that helps the throat chakra. So ultimately, my throat chakra is going to benefit. But my biggest struggle was my knees. That was my number one struggle. Sometimes it was hard to walk. Like I can concentrate and I'm fully aware. So there's no problems there. It's just that sometimes my knees and my legs did not want to go. And that's what's great about fasting. I had that problem last time during the September, October fast. Right? I had problems with knees. As my mother was exiting this reality, she had a problem with knees. And my issues with knees make me think of my mother and I wondered was there a genetic situation going on here I don't know but what I do know is with the right application of principles a person can overcome these things can transform themselves and um, I was starting to do some research how can I overcome this at the very time that it's the best time to overcome it? Because if I can solve it here where it's not just a symptom that you can just melt away, but then it's still there. You just don't have the symptoms because you're eating and you're doing all this other stuff. But push comes to shove and you do have like a critical uh, health situation. There it is, compounding the situation. Can you solve it? Through the struggles I have right now, right? Well, I don't have them now, but there's a point during fasting where you get past these things and it's like, Phew. but let me say this very clearly. The struggles that I've had during this fast that, where I was able to know in my body where my weakest points are if i can address them during this moment then when i age physiologically as they say unless we do like brian johnson right i do follow brian johnson i think his stuff is legit the guy who's um, spent millions of dollars um, improving his health to 
the extent where he's reversed age, his, his biological age. I'm only a few years older than him. And I've done the same things as him, just slightly different. Mine is less pharmaceutical than his approach. Mine is more earth nature, but it's the same outcome. But anyway, but what I'm saying is, if I end up at an age where if I didn't do anything, then my likelihood of dementia, you see, my grandmother on my father's side, no, my grandmother on my mother and my father's side, both struggled with dementia. So then I'm again thinking, am I going to deal with that when I reach their age? You know, you just wonder about these things, right? You, you see what has happened with others in your lineage, in your life. Can I make different choices? Can I make different choices? And if I succeed, can it help others with my same genetics, my same chemistry? So I'm like, on some level, this is bigger than me. So it's like, yeah, let me, let me work on this. Let me work on this. Let me understand some techniques, some things that can be done, some preventative actions. Because I got nieces that I've helped raise. One is about to turn two years old. Another, I think, is about to turn 13 or something like that. Hey, I worked with both of them from the time they were, right? How lucky is that? How much of a coincidence is that? But anyway, and I'm the oldest of several siblings, right? Who some are much younger than I, who may run into some things one day. It'd be nice to be in a position to give some reliable advice on, hey, this is what I went through and this is what I did. We got the same blood and genetics. This might help you. So I worked on my knees. I found some techniques that were physical, but I also found some herbs. I found some herbs. A nettle leaf is a good herb that actually does work. So I um, took nettle leaf tea. Um, got it over there somewhere. But, you know, traditional medicinals is my brand of choice for tea. And they had nettle leaf tea in the store. And I looked on the box and it said, joint support. I said, hey, I'm doing tea as far, part of this fast. Why not? I started drinking it, doing it more like a dosage kind of thing, once or twice a day. And I saw my knees actually get better. I was like, oh, that's wonderful. And that's part of the power of fasting, that you can have these struggles, but you also have the opportunity to work on them if you maintain the will to persevere beyond the limitations you experience to where you have these personal breakthroughs. Now, I will say this, though, that some of the physiological limitations or um, slight debilitation that I've experienced in some areas of my body, and usually I'm fine from the waist up, perfectly fine. And that's actually where I focus the majority of my research in terms of staying um, viable in the midst of a fast. I put so much research there, I didn't, didn't uh, stop to think about from the waist down. It just didn't. I was like, if so I thought that if this is working 100% or 1,000%, then I could at least have the willpower to keep all the rest of this going. And to the most part, that, that's true, right? 
if you apply your mind, you can override the body. But it's like some overriding is is takes is more taxing and takes more energy than others. And trying to walk, even get up and take steps, especially in a work environment where you can average anywhere from 10,000 to some cases approaching 30,000 steps. So anyway, it's like, man. So I learned, I learned some physical techniques like you take your thighs while you're sitting down, you just squeeze them. Just squeeze some thighs and get that blood flowing. Leverage that magnesium and calcium interaction. You need muscle contraction out here. Just start bending your knees. Just bend them before you get up and go. And then you you have a little bit better mobility. So that's what I, I worked with. One of the things I figured out as physical techniques. And then, like I said, the nettle leaf tea with the joint support. And then dandelion root. Not roasted dandelion root, but dandelion root and leaf was useful. That one's slanted more towards uh, kidney um, kidney support. And um, but then I and also um, combine all of that with red clover to help with skin. Because one of the things that helped me uh, get into fasting in the first place. In 2022 was the outward symptoms of autoimmune disease. My hands were all bloody and scaly and all of this from COVID. I, you know, because I was trying to put chemicals on my hands to keep back germs and all that. And then I put nitrile gloves on and I was doing all that and I would, I ended up damaging my skin, but I didn't know it at the time. I didn't, I didn't connect the two to it. I didn't connect that activity of putting these harsh chemicals on my skin and uh, the chemicals bleeding into my bloodstream and then making all its, making its way down. I thought I had psoriasis or eczema and I was using psoriasis creams and all that. Long story short, I got rid of the processed oils, the processed sugar and the thick bread. Those are my three that I, I focused in on in May, 2022. And in coordinating with uh, a three day prolonged fast with um, just liquids. And I think that one was just water. Yeah, that was just water. Because I didn't know about coconut water or electrolytes back then. And I definitely dealt with uh, brain fog. But leading up to that, I was doing intermittent fasting. And exiting out of that fast, the skin started clearing up. I started seeing improvement throughout. And um, yeah, but... <laughs> So that, that was some of the struggle that I dealt with. I didn't deal with the struggle of getting up out of bed quite as much, though there were maybe two, maybe three, maybe a maximum of four days where that was um, a struggle. But for the most part, um, the regimen of coconut water and using distilled water with trace mineral drops that have a good electrolyte uh, formulation in it was um, vital to continuing through this fast in an effective way. And then I did an experiment part of this fast because these fasts, I'm doing experiments on my physiology in order to improve. And one of those is I introduced the use of a formulation called cell food. And I talk about that extensively in a previous video, so I won't go into great depth here. But I mixed up with distilled water, and it helps. It oxygenates the cells. It actually provides nutrients to the cells, and it removes cellular waste, according to what they were representing about the product. So I did that for the better part of 25 days. And in the process of introducing distilled water into my process, what I learned was that, because spring water also has electrolytes in it, just not to the extent of coconut water, there was that one day 
where I was brewing some tea and I mistakenly used distilled water instead of spring water. And I was drinking this water all day thinking I had the spring water, but it was distilled water and I felt weaker than I'd felt in a good while during fasting. And I felt awful that day and I told a coworker, I was like, man, I feel really bad. And then later that evening, I was able to trace it back to, I used distilled water instead of spring water when brewing my tea. Because I was using distilled water very strategically and very uh, specifically when I wake up to put these formulations in. I was using distilled water as a transmitter and a carrier of these formulations. Because distilled water is not a source of hydration. So anyway, I learned a lesson there about making sure you use the right liquids. So that's um, some of the struggles that I saw with fasting. And there's probably others, but I would belabor the conversation if I were to keep digging in to try to uncover them all. But those are the major ones that come to mind. And they are all surmountable with enough planning enough foresight and preparation. But there's one last thing on that. Fasting with liquids is the most effective if you could do it on a schedule. A good schedule, let's say, hydrating on the liquid of choice, whether it be coconut water or spring water or trace mineral enhanced distilled water Roughly every two, two hours, I would say. My situation is one where I couldn't do that. I operate in environments that um, requires your full attention and you really can't step away adequately and remember, oh, two hours has passed, I need to do this. I was able to force that in last time but this time, it was like, it just wasn't um, a thing to do. But putting my own personal process or situation aside, if you could do it every two hours, keep the liquids flowing each two hour period cycle, your body responds better and you're able to maintain a more level electrolyte balance. Well, what happened with me is I would hydrate more heavily after I woke up during a two hour span. And then at some point I go to work, maybe hydrate within that first hour. And then over the span of about four to six hours, I'm hydrating much less. Like I might not hydrate again for another four hours, you know, three hours or four hours, right? And during that, that, uh, that, that break time, right? Get some hydration in. I typically like to just get in my car, drive to Kroger's or Walmart, buy some harmless harvest, because this is actually my main coconut water, but I was get, I got into the habit of drinking this only while, while I was uh, you know, at home. And then while I was out, I would drink harmless harvest. I wouldn't drink harmless harvest while I'm here. The uh, reason is, is that harmless harvest has an excess of sugar, but I would use that excess of sugar for my strenuous work schedule, right? Whereas if you're not very active, right? Moving around, then something like this that's a little more tame is more appropriate in terms of your, in terms of biochemistry. So whenever I needed to really perform and be active, I would find a way to get harmless harvest. So I would go to Kroger or Walmart to get me a bottle, a bottle or two. So then that kept me going in large part, but that would be my only hydration for another, let's say, four hours or so. Now, there were some days where I was able to have hydration more frequently than that, but 
even then, if I was able to bring in a larger flask of, let's say, hot tea, I'm not drinking it properly. I'm sipping a little bit here and then putting it away. And I might not see it again for another hour or two. And it's just sips. When you're supposed to take in a certain number of ounces during those, those intervals. And so I didn't do any of that. And I still made it. But you will make it even more if you try this process, if you do it on a rhythm, a very strict, defined rhythm. And if you could do that and hold to it, your fasting will be a, a much easier prospect than what I experienced. But even despite those struggles, I learned a lot. I picked up a lot. I got those downloads from the universe, as it were. And the universe knows I'm not looking for like this pie in the sky esoteric experience. I want to I want to practically apply spirituality to everyday ordinary life experience in this incarnation. Spiritual being having a human experience. Well, if I'm going to have a human human experience, let's make it the best human experience possible. And Let's use the spirit. Let's use spirituality to have a great human experience rather than say, oh, my spirit manifested into a body. Now I'm ready to go. I came here on a ticket. Hey, I grew up, became an adult, and now I'm like, I can't wait to get out of here. What kind of what kind of um, cycle is that? Life cycle, spiritual life, where you've got a spirit that's, al that's alive in the spirit world, and it wants to come alive in this physical world, and it chose to come alive in the spiritual world as a soul and spirit. And then once it gets here, it says, I'm already ready to leave. It doesn't make any sense. You should have just stayed where you were at. <laughs> Should just stay where you're at instead of coming here. If you's going to complain and do all that, just stay where you're at. Don't come here. Come here to do some things, to experience some things, to learn some things, right? And then you've done all you can do. Either transition at that point or find a way to do some more. If, like Brian Johnson and others have designed, or we might live to 200 plus or more, hey, do some more things. <laughs> but I don't see it as productive to be a spirit that's incarnate in this physical form and to complain about that incarnation once you've arrived here. It doesn't make any sense to me. It never really did might have bought into that when I was much younger in my 20s, you know, but over time I was like, it doesn't make any sense. And it's like, you came here. Do something while you're here and do something cons constructive, productive, useful, that at the very least makes things more, more, enlightening in terms of understanding when and if you do go back. That's all I'm saying. So the struggles in fasting and in life in general can be useful in that regard. So let's see what else we could talk about while we're here. Food cravings, food cravings. Do you starve to death when you're fasting? No, you don't starve to death when you're fasting. It is a known fact in terms of like people who experience fasting, but also the scientific research 
Oh, by the way, keep in mind that even though I'm on a spiritual process and I believe in the primacy of the Spirit and the primacy of ancient writings and teachings, I'm very much in on it with science. I programmed computers for over 25 years. Computers don't deal in fuzzy logic. Computers don't deal in gray areas. That's not what computer hardware does. It's black and white. Scientific principles, mathematics, logic. It has to be concrete, rock solid. Biology can be observed in a laboratory under a microscope. We can know through physics, physics theories that can be proven even by those of us that are not in a laboratory to be true. Physics is true. Geology is true. Climate science is true. Biological sciences are, are accurate for the most part. But the scientific process is a fundamentally effective process for understanding this physical reality, including the energetic aspects connected with it and that define it. So I'm 1,000% in line with science and scientific methods. I just believe that <laughs> science can confirm or supplement, not replace, but supplement and reinforce and enhance the spiritual understanding. Because the spiritual understanding is subjective. So I'm pretty well read in critical thinking, empirical thought, and problem solving and logic. But that doesn't shut off the part of my brain that deals in intuition, that deals in inner, inner knowledge, common sense, and natural connection with nature itself. It doesn't shut off all that. But it is proven to Science has proven to me in the technical work I've done in the computer arts and sciences that it is absolutely rock solid. But it's not a replacement and it's not primary over our subjective experience. I'll say it like this. My life as a human being living in this bio biological form my life comes before a computer. My life is more valuable than a building. My life is more valuable than any material thing that man can create. My life is more valuable than any book. My life is more valuable than any philosophy. And my life is more valuable, more valuable than objective truth. My life is more valuable than that. My first obligation is to live, survive, thrive. and be alive moment to moment. And then falling from that to maximize those things I just said. So it follows that anything that I subjectively feel enhances me inwardly is something that I would put priority on. Now not saying just spirituality. For others, that subjective priority could be entertainment. It could be sports. It could be whatever it is. 
whatever it is that is non-scientific, okay? So, I went on a wild tangent there, well, not a wild one, but a long one, to say that science knows how the stomach works because it's observed it in great detail. So when you start having hunger feelings and sensations, that is not necessarily an indication of starvation. That is an indication of the body's request to bring in nutrition, to bring in fuel. And you can override that sensation with the mind. You can just do it straight out. Or one technique I've bumped into, but it's a valid technique, is you could just simply ignore the growling. You just ignore it. And if you ignore it long enough, the body's physiology, it moves on. There's a time limit for how long it will growl and request food, fuel, nutrition. It's a time limit. And when the clock runs out on that, it doesn't bother you anymore for a while. So because of that, the times between those, uh, those hunger sensations gets longer and longer. You might get it once a day, whereas before you might get it three or four times a day. It gets longer and longer. And I've had it where I might get it once every three days, once every four days. It's just gone. So, but I've learned tricks in how to induce it on purpose. Because if you induce it on purpose and you ignore it, you can help perpetuate HGH, human growth hormone, which helps you develop physiologically in other ways. Anyway, so, but you do have a desire for food still, but through this process, you're able to control that desire, control those thought uh, processes. But there's another aspect to it, and this is the aspect I tap into. And that is, I use this time to just plan. How am I going to eat? How am I going to steer my diet? See, sometimes it's hard to, to steer your diet in a different direction when you're in the middle of eating, you know, day to day. It's like, you just can't pull yourself away from what you just had yesterday when you know it's wrong. It's like it, it builds its own momentum. But when you've created so much distance from certain things that you've eaten that you would prefer not to eat, either by choice or in some cases by necessity, because, you know, maybe what you've eaten is helping you down the road of diabetes, obesity, heart disease, strokes, cognitive decline, autoimmune disease, you name it. And it's like, you get to the point where you're just like, I'm tired of it. I'm tired of it. I don't want to deal with any of that anymore. I just need some space. Give me my space, bruh. You get your space where you're like, okay, I'm not worried about food day to day. What can we do about food when we start up again? If I had to do over again, it's like I ask you that question. If I had to do over again, what would I do differently? And that's what I do during these fasts. I ask a lot of questions like that. Not just about food. I ask that about a lot of different things. It's like I'm in full reset mode right now. So my uh, video from Sunday covers that. In my case. So I won't go into all that here. My April 7th, 2024 video covers that. In great detail. Anyway. But. Yeah. You do feel hungry sometimes. And you can get past it. It gets easier to get past it. The longer you do it. But. The, the best part. Is you really get to think about what you're gonna do differently. So I spent like 30, maybe 40 hours during this fast uh, time frame researching nutrition, diet. I've, I've done hundreds of hours of that 
over the last uh, two, two and a half years. But there's always new information that comes out. And there's always a way to refine your understanding. And I've been trying to get more to the nitty gritty. And some of it for me is that the changes I know I needed to do two, two and a half years ago, I just wasn't mentally ready to do that. I just couldn't get there cold turkey like that. You know, if you go back um, to when I first became a vegetarian, right? The last meat that I ate was salmon. Prior to that, I would eat chicken. And then prior to that, I would eat beef if you go back to the year uh, 2000. It was a gradual process of shaving these things off. It's taken me a long time to get to where others have gotten in their 20s or 30s. Maybe they were raised vegan. Maybe they were raised in a way where they could eat the right way. Just part of their culture. Maybe they was raised in a, in a culture, in a country, part of a religion or a society that naturally has a blue zone aspect to it. I didn't, I didn't grow up in anything like that. If I were to give it a word, I didn't grow up in a blue zone. I grew up in a red zone. As red zone as you can get. So it was much harder to just peel these things away. And even when I was, I switched over to vegetarianism in 2006, you know, I thought I was doing good. And I found out that by the time I got to 2020, Buddy, you wasn't doing as good as you thought because you still had processed oils and you still had processed sugar and you still had these shortcuts you were doing where you wasn't eating meat, but you was eating non-meat stuff that was just as bad, if not worse. So I need to make some serious changes somewhere around late 2021, early 2022. And I was gradually making those changes, but some habits they die hard like I no longer use canola oil but I still cooked with oil quite a bit even if it was olive oil and olive oil is not always appropriate uh, to cook with but it was better than cooking with canola oil and that's just one example but I had to make these gradual changes and these fasts they helped me coupled with research I was doing leading up to the fast and during the fast and shortly thereafter each fast to make the changes I needed to get to where I ultimately needed to be many years ago which is primarily raw plant-based fruit-based diet and that fruit-based part is more recent I didn't know that until a couple of months ago thanks to soon to be Dr. Yaki Hickman of East St. Louis. But a fully raw or nearly raw plant-based diet with an abundance of fruits is the best diet. And I just couldn't get there, even though I knew what was being presented by these learned individuals, these well-researched individuals. I psychologically couldn't get there. So I needed a process of gradual transformation, gradual, incremental, in order to get there. So that's uh, what I embarked on. And I would have to say that it's been very instructive. I've learned what to do, what not to do. And I think once this fast concludes today, right, and tomorrow I start eating, I believe I'll be on a better track. So what does the future of food look like? What does the future of food look like for me? The future of food for me is twofold. 
And I say that very, very deliberately. It's too far. Number one, there's the food that I make myself in private and that I carry with me when I go out places, like to work or on a trip or go driving. And that is fruits I can buy at Kroger's or Walmart or Publix or wherever, as well as farmer's market, preferably a farmer's market. So fruits and also certain vegetables. And I talk about all of that in the April 7th video, right? But it's the food that I make myself under my own criteria, which is try to stick to soups, Japanese style soups, and also Indian style doll recipes, both of which has minimal use of oil. Previously, I was cooking food in oil, including up to a few months ago. When this fast concludes, I will use less oil in food that I cook to actually cook the food. And my plan is to use oil more as a finishing oil. That is, I'm going to steam my vegetables or boil them in those instances that I eat vegetables. And then once it's finished steaming or boiling, and I put it in a pot, it put it on a plate or put it in a bowl to eat, then I'm gonna apply oil to it. I don't apply oil during the cooking process, you see. So use oil after the fact, not during cooking. that's going to be more for the Japanese style entrees that I make for myself. For the ending in dolls that I cook using lentils or chickpeas, I might put a little bit of coconut oil into the mix towards the end of the simmering process. <laughs> or I might do it after the fact. But I'm going to avoid in both cases stir frying vegetables in oil. Keep that to a minimum. Make that a rare thing. So that's my plan as far as how I will make food. Very simple, very straightforward, very healthy, organic, non-GMO, and very little oil except finishing oil. And the great thing about finishing oil, using coconut oil or olive extra virgin olive oil, is that I get more of the benefit of those oils without degrading those oils during the cooking process. So it's going to be a win-win for me. And I'll get healthier fats that way. The second part, because I said it was twofold, is when I eat out. Minimize eating out. But I accept that when I eat out, that I expose myself to genetically modified food and processed oils. I accept the fact of that. <laughs> and I go into the process of eating out with my eyes wide open and just be very careful with what I choose to eat out when I do eat out. <laughs> that includes restaurants that are advertised as very healthy, but who in fact use processed sugars and processed oils, even in a healthy meal or a meal that's otherwise very healthy. It has fresh greens, uh, simmered lentils or beans, black beans or whatever, <laughs> or you know, cut and uh, steamed vegetables. But in order to make those meals taste good to the general public, there's going to be some sugar in there. There's going to be some oils in there. 
and water both are not always going to be the best oils for the body. But I won't even say do it in moderation. If you keep it to a minimum, if I keep it to a minimum, then I'll have less issues with eating out in the future. So that's how I'm going to approach that. That's how I'm going to approach that. So that's the dietary perspective as I exit this fast. And so my fast, it ends in a couple of hours. And I look forward to the future. And I hope this dialogue was helpful to, to some. And if you have any questions, I do respond to comments attached to the video. And I'll see you later. I thought about this process of diet and the best type of nutrition and mix and combination of flavors and nutrients and preparation methods in Japanese style rises to the top in terms of the consistency of the nutrition. Your opportunity for anyone who goes through this process is to exit the matrix of death diets by rejecting processed oils seed oils like canola oil, soybean oil, and get rid of processed sugars, fake sugars, processed breads, so that you have a healthier body and a healthier total being. And when you do so, you get to reset the quality of your life to a higher level through a better gut microbiome and regenerate and rejuvenate through autophagy so that your cells have a chance to regenerate properly and we remove the bad cells and we remove the things in our body that don't fit the quality of life we aim for so that we give our highest self more of an opportunity to leverage the temple in this incarnation, in this physical reality. And in so doing, we can go forward towards living our best life.